Welcome to Character Assassination, a podcast of art, tea, and murder most foul. Each episode, a creator of characters is inducted into the Society for Ungentlemanly Conduct, where they'll have a lovely chat with us about all kinds of nonsense as they unleash a new character from their creative loins before cruelly but necessarily committing it to a worthy, horrific death. I'm your chap at large, Nereus, and this episode we're joined by Brett Jubinville, perhaps best known as a creator of the Super Science Friends. So, sit back, put the kettle on, and clench your buttocks. No particular reason for that last, I just wanted to see if anyone would do it. Anyway, this is Character Assassination. It's another wet day here at Castle Squid Ink, which we can't really complain about because, to be honest, we chose to make our castle also a submarine. But, you know, the weight of the turrets means we can't have a surface, and that means there's always fish in the toilet. But anyway, we actually have some company today. So we've broken out the good china for our delightfully unsuspecting guest, Brett Jubinville. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So we're shortly going to be inducting you into the Society for Ungentlemanly Conduct, where we'll witness you bring a poor soul into existence, because there's nothing more ungentlemanly than subjecting an innocent character to a life of misery. But first, we're not complete savages, so let's start with the pleasantries. Who the devil are you? (laughs) Who I am is, uh, I'm Brett Jubinville, I'm a... Probably most known for uh, creating a show called Super Science Friends, which is you can find it on the YouTube. And uh, otherwise, I'm I'm an animation director, and I've been working in animation for a long time. As uh, I, but I started as a character designer, so this is kind of perfect. Wonderful, and of course, the most important part. What is your your tea of choice? Well, I don't really drink a lot of tea, so my go-to is always Earl Grey because I'm a big Star Trek fan. Tea, Earl Grey, hot. <laughs> exactly, make it so. <laughs> Okay, so let's begin the squalid, nasty business of squeezing a new character out of your squishy bits. How does your particular process begin? Uh, usually, well, I'm, I, I do a lot of writing nowadays, but uh, because I started as a drawer, uh, and I didn't start coming at this from the other side, uh, I would always come up with characters just from randomly sketching. So it was always a sketchbook, and then just drawing whatever happened to take my fancy at the time. I, I usually go through spurts of different inspiration. Um, when I came up with Super Science Runs, for example, it was I was playing Fallout New Vegas, and there was a character that looked... Uh, he was a hazmat suit that was autonomous, and it was carrying around the skeleton of the guy from 200 years ago that was in wearing the suit. Yeah. And that became the, the space ghoul, which was the start of the whole thing. So it usually comes from a sketch. Now, I know you've talked before about how you created Super Science Friends and its pitch package overnight. Would you say that's your preferred method of working, that kind of pressured one-night session? Yeah, because that, that's the only way I knew. At the time, that was the only way I knew how to write anything was mm. to draw it, draw it out first. So it was, it was a long night of me just drawing characters based on that initial sketch that I really liked. And they ended up turning out pretty, pretty, I still have them, and they, they look uh, very similar to what we ended up going with. There wasn't a whole lot of revisions yeah. there. That's actually an interesting point. With Super Science Runs, you have characters who exist in history. How do you begin recreating those to make them more your own and more your own style? That's a good question. It's. I think I should. I should start by saying, like, I don't really have a style. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, there, there's a style that I draw in naturally if I just sit down to sketch for fun. Yeah. But it's, it's nothing to write home about. Like, it's not anything uh, that I would, that I would put my name to and say that's my style. Right. So, whenever I come up with stuff, it's usually inspired by something else. So, uh, I had just come off of working on a show called Ugly Americans, mm-hmm. which is when I came up with, uh, with Super Science Friends. So there was, there was a a fair bit of that influence in the fact that I did like a 2D graphic novel sort of look, but I also stripped away a lot of the, the um, stuff that made ugly Americans really difficult to animate. Right. And I tried to pare that down as far as like translating the characters though. I'm pretty bad at caricatures. So I, I, I'm I'm glad I got as close as I did, but um, we actually have a a character designer who's working with us now, Katie, who, who the, one of the things she's really good at is actually like looking up a character and then, translating it into, I guess, my style or the Super right. Science Friends style. She just did um, 
I'm going to do the cleanup on it in the future, but it, she did uh, J.P. Morgan, George Westinghouse, and Alan Turing yesterday, nice. I think, or the day before. Uh, and they look great. They look just like the people. Mine, mine would be, I would go like, yeah, this is Freud. And then you <laughs> look at it and go like, yeah, he's got a beard. Sure. Uh, it must be Freud. Now, you also have a spin-off series of super science friends called Sneaky Little Nazis, where the central characters are essentially clones of the same Nazi stooge. How did you go about creating an interesting, engaging design for a character that was going to be duplicated multiple times on the screen? Yeah, there were two things for that one. So the first was they needed to be dead easy to animate because I knew there were going to be a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so boxes with little legs. Um, and I'm a big fan of a show called Clone High. And uh, there's there's a character in that named Cinnamon Scudworth, who's the, kind of the bad guy. And uh, so I took a lot of reference from him because he has this long kind of scientist coat and these gloves and that sort of thing. And also, uh, the other thing that was out then was that short um, with Doogie Hauser. Oh, um, <laughs> you know, oh, Patrick so, Harris. Uh, yeah, um, Dr. Horrible Doc- Long Blog. Dr. Horrible. Yeah, and he had a similar look, that kind of mad oh, yeah. scientist. So it was a very mad scientist. Because at the time, too, we were trying to decide what to do with the Nazis thematically. Uh, yeah. Like, are they are they Hitler's Nazis? Are they are they the big bad guys? Do we talk about the Holocaust and things like that, right. or are they more like mad scientists? Which is where we ended up taking them because it's just a little bit more lighthearted. So putting the probably multiple challenges you'd face creating lighthearted Nazis aside, when you're approaching a new character, do you prefer to have a need for a certain type of character in mind when you start? Nowadays, for sure. I, I actually don't come up with a lot of random characters on my own these days just because there's always a show to i also do, do some kids shows on uh on the other side of things yeah <clears throat> so there's always something there's always a need for it but even back in the day like i i don't remember ever just like like you know those people who can sit around and draw just for the doodle. love of drawing yeah. and they have these amazing sketchbooks that you open and they've done painting in some and little <clears throat> that, that does not exist my sketchbook is full of like half drawn arms that i wasn't happy with so i just turned yeah. the page um, but I really envy those people that can just sit and draw for the fun of it. But I, I always, halfway through a drawing, I start thinking of like a show idea for that drawing. Sure. Like, where could I, what could I do with this? Yeah, I'm very um, suspicious of those people who can just kind of draw for the sake of drawing. It always seems to be, it's much harder for me to draw unless I have something in mind. Yeah, and maybe it's maybe it's that they don't have an interest in writing or, or there's yeah. something that they just, they're... Maybe what you love is a spectrum, and they just they're shifted all the way to the left. Exactly. Yeah, their sketchbooks don't have nearly as many heads in theirs as mine does. That's, that's all I seem <laughs> to true. get sometimes. Just heads. So the decidedly ungentlemanly business of creating characters is not usually something people associate with being able to feed yourself on a regular basis or living particularly comfortably. How did you find yourself plopping into it? Uh, I always I would always draw. Mm-hmm. Um, so in my kid in, in my high school, sorry, I was I was the drawing kid, so I was the yeah. the art kid in my high school of a mm-hmm. thousand people or something. And um, I remember ending ending high school and not knowing what to do. Mm-hmm. I was I was always fine. I wasn't a good student. I was very very lazy, but I was cl- clever enough that if I went to class, I paid attention. I'd be right. fine with a, with a good B average. Yeah. Um, and my art teacher said, well. The, 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 there's really only two ways you can do. You could do illustration or you could do animation. And because I was such a lazy student, illustration really ap- appealed to me because I'm like, oh, one, one drawing versus, you know, a hundred drawings. That's, yeah. there is no, there is no conversation here. Um, but in the end, she, she convinced me to take an animation course. So I applied for a, to a local college and uh, I got in and, and I went that way. And even there, I was a pretty lazy student too. So I would, I focused not on animation, but mostly on design, because right. again, fewer fewer drawings. Uh, so that's that's really where I got my start in character design, and where I started to hone it. And that, that coincidentally, that was about you know early two thousand. So that was around the time that things like forums on the internet and sure. and uh, Tumblr Tumblr wouldn't be for a few years at that point. But, yeah. But just there were a lot more resources to, to find great art and great artists, and a lot of people did character design. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the tools you're going to be using to birth this new character you're creating. What's your preferred medium? Do you use digital, uh, pencil sketches, scalpel and forceps? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I usually prefer to do it on a sketchbook if I can. If I'm at work and I need to bang out a character, I'll just hop right onto the sketchbook or right onto the Photoshop, which is what I'm going to do today. The other thing is, like, my sketches are, are without an undo button or an eraser. That's that's easy. <laughs> my sketches are atrocious, and yeah. they're just all slanted and stuff like that. So I'm going to try and like just adjust as I go. So this. I don't make an embarrassment of myself. If there's something we do well at the Society for Ungentlemanly Conduct, it's make an embarrassment of ourselves. So you're in good company. But I always find that, especially on a tablet, the empty screen is a kind of basilisk stare. I don't always know what to do straight away. So what are you starting with? I'm going to start with the head. As you said, lots of heads in the mm-hmm. sketchbook. That's usually is that's usually the first uh, the first hard no is when you get halfway through that and you go like, eh, no, that's next good. page. Do you do that thing when you're starting with a head where you have a sort of go to shape? I mean, I sort of cheat a lot when I'm like, oh yeah, all of my heads are the same shape. Yeah, if I'm if I'm um, I'll kind of draw as I go, yeah. but if I if I'm drawing just for the sake of, of of drawing while I'm watching Netflix or something like that, I tend to default to a very like Joe Maggiera, Joe Mad. <laughs> um, yeah. kind of profile with like the big greek nose sure and uh and that kind of really thick skin meaty stuff because i i think i went through a joe mad phase at a at a pivotal moment in my life and so it's kind of burned in there yeah uh, but he has a very particular profile and it's usually like that garrison if you're familiar with battle chasers oh yes uh, sort of you know masculine profile it's almost a tom cruise uh, profile because yeah. he has the same nose and the same kind of Structure, it's like a muscular Tom Cruise. Sure, sort of statuesque, sort of a, a look. Yeah, Excellent. so I got loads of those. <laughs> they, they don't do me any good because I can't, it's not animatable and I, I, it's his thing. So it's, yeah. But it is my, my sit-down warm-up go-to. Are there any other characters or designers that influence your, uh, your mannerisms or your, uh, your preferred way of sketching or drawing? Mike Mignola is a big one. Yeah. He's, he's a guy where it's um, like... I, when I look at his pencil drawings versus his inks, it's like one is just a black version of one and the other one is a gray version. <laughs> yeah. there, he does not screw around. It's just so clean the way he works. Yeah. Um, and he, and I've heard that he's he's very unhappy with his with his particular style, or at least he's very self, I don't know, not self-conscious, but self-deprecating a little bit. Because when yeah. they did uh, that short, The Amazing Screw on Head, I heard he wasn't happy with it being in his style or something like that. That was an amazing short, and it kind of it, it reflected his style really well. And and I think that's why when we saw the Hellboy animated ones later, they got Sean Galloway to do yeah. the designs on that. Mm-hmm. And I spoke with Sean Galloway after that, and and just because they they kind of did this hodgepodge where they went, I saw Sean's first designs, right, and then I saw what they ended up looking like, and it was like a watered down version of it. And yeah. I thought, I said to him, like they should have either done it in Magnola's style, right. Or in Cheeks' style, Galloway. Yeah. yeah. Or, but the and he was, I think he was a little unhappy with the way that he had to revise it down, right, to be this kind of half Batman sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I seem to remember that he he was sort of unhappy with the the animation process anyway because they wanted him to actually be involved with animation and do turnarounds and everything as well, and he just wasn't interested in that side, <laughs> which is understandable. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that a lot of a lot of students that I talk to who want to be character designers, quote unquote, uh, yeah. I always I always kind of break that bubble for them where I say like, just so you know, you you're envisioning a job where you come to work and someone gives you a list of characters that need to be designed and you're and you're like, oh, great, new characters, and and that does happen sometimes, but generally speaking, you're doing rotation sheets, you're doing pose sheets, you're doing special poses for animators who don't know how to draw the character in a particular way. Sure. Um, so it's a very much a grind of a job if you happen to work at an animation studio as a character designer. Yeah. It's not. It's not the drawn the, the guys on the poster twenty four seven. It's like the difference between people who want to draw comic books and people who want to just draw the splash pages and the tin-ups on yeah. the white books. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good analogy. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Right, let's set the scene for the birth of your character. Now, you're in a basement laboratory on the worst side of town, the fashion district. It's not a particularly clean laboratory. No one's been down there with a broom for a while. And the surgeon attending you is not exactly qualified. Now, would you prefer, ideally, for your character's birth to go well, born under a bad sign, or to live a life of good luck? I picture something like the the surgery room in the 1987 Batman with... 
where it's the, just the, the light kind of swinging from the ceiling <laughs> and this old crazy surgeon. Uh, I think probably more more interesting to be born under a bad sign. Yeah. Uh, maybe a bit of a, a defect or, or some sort of half-breed is always fun. Well, that sounds just lovely. But we're going to have to throw a spanner in the works. At this point, we need to introduce our random number generator. His name is Suitcase. Say hello, Suitcase. We call him Suitcase because he lives in a suitcase. We don't know what he looks like. Now, Suitcase will spit out a randomly generated number twixt 1 and 10 to determine the success of your wishes for your character. Suitcase, if you'd be so kind. You got an 8. You were successful. He's born almost completely under a bad sign. Congratulations, you've birthed this poor character into a life of almost complete abject misery. Are you proud of yourself? Uh, well, for the sake of drawing interesting stuff, I am, but uh, for Marcus. the sake of this poor soul, uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we said, you know, this isn't the most gentlemanly of careers. You're creating lives which, you know, are probably going to have more interesting things happen to them, which is probably going to be bad stuff. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, the physical attributes, creating your characters. Do the tools you use generally affect the way you design a character, or is it th- directly from your brain to the page? No, I'm, I'm usually very aware of what the end result needs to be, so if, if it's going to be animated in a certain way. So if I'm designing a CG character, for example, yeah. um, I will be very cautious of uh, neck, sure. hips, armpits because that tends to be where a lot of like rigging complications yeah, come yeah. in uh things like that i'll try and design as simply as i can sure. uh if i'm designing just for for the the hell of it or for a character that say i'm not going to see very often um or only from a particular angle so you mentioned sneaky little nazis so yeah. the demon barrera too yeah uh is a highly complex character in relation to the show but i know that i'm only ever going to see him from one perspective and he's only ever going to be doing one thing which is just like that kind of wriggling around so that one we felt a little bit uh a little bit more free on that i didn't even do the first design on that so a guy named uh, march and Surma did but i did the the final cleanup yeah uh, design on it so no i know from personal experience with my obsession with putting tentacles on things that they're not the easiest thing to animate do you create your assets in a cutout style Super Science Friends is more or less frame by frame. We keep the head and torso in a symbol, so it can, so we don't have to redraw it every time. Oh, sure. And and then on the on the kids shows that I direct, we do have a lot of like, as you say, cutout style yeah. where um, where you're moving designs around. Uh, but we try and I always try and keep everybody who who works at the studio and stuff like that drawing as much as possible because I find that's oddly it's something that that is being lost in the animation field is either yeah. it's it's shifting to cg or it's um or it's it's toon boom and it's very puppeted uh sure. which is it is not a look that i like like when we do a puppeted show i or a cutout show i always go out of the way to make sure that it it works like the design needs to work with that style of animation of because We've all seen like the ones where Archer, I think, is a good example. Yeah. So Archer is a show that I love. I love the dialogue. I love the writing. Everything. The animation, ugh. it's it's like it's the designs are too good for that type of animation. Sure. And Bojack Bojack Horseman's uh, similar in that it it's almost like I know why they did the things that they did, and I know why they animated the way that they do. But um, it's it almost feels like a simpler design would have benefited more or something like that yeah that makes sense no it does make sense i mean with uh, with cut out animation and i do cut out animation as well it's it really only works if uh, you know as you say it works with the, the actual design of things so for example south park it's yeah. it's cut out and it works with the, the intention of design and same with terry gilliam's animations you know they were cut outs as well and they they work with the intention of that as well yeah and but the the other thing i'll say is like for those shows like bojack and archer yeah you only really notice the the art like for the first episode, and then after that, yeah. the story takes it. So maybe that's saying something about the pickiness of uh, of, <laughs> of character designers when we look at that and go like, ugh. So yeah, I've seen it. No, because <laughs> it's, yeah. it's I find it's the same with video games. It's like if I, don't, I really don't care how good the graphics are because it's 
that'll impress me for five minutes, and then if the gameplay sucks, I'll turn it off. It's true, the whole package needs to be immersive, with the art kind of serving to drag you into the story, which leads us nicely onto our next section, communication. How do you feel you approach communicating who the character is through the design that you're creating for them? Um, it's a good question. It's uh, I, I I wonder if I if I don't even think about it that yeah. that uh, consciously, sure, uh, or if it's just something where I, I get to the point where I'm like, yeah, this looks good. It's going to serve its purpose. Um, I tend to work, especially as a director, in a I, I really like the TV. TV series pace, oh, yeah. um, which is the you do the best you can with what you got, and then you move on to the next one. And if there's something you weren't happy with, you try and make it better next time. Yeah, uh, I really like that versus the you know uh, you know kill yourself and 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 overthink it and and stuff over and over again. So I, I think if I were to ever direct a feature film, it would just be the end of me because <laughs> they tend to tend to give you more time more. More time to second guess yourself, right? Sure, that's the the beauty of the deadline is you've got to, you have to finish at some point. You've got to finish it, and I think that that spurs a lot of creativity, at least for me. So, oh, definitely. Uh, when it when it comes to the higher level thinking about uh, that sort of thing, I'm maybe I'm 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 not a high thinker that way. Well, I kind of want to argue a little bit with you there, because earlier this year Nickelodeon released your short Ramblers, where two of the characters wear what are basically scout uniforms. Now, the central character, Norville, has an empty sash, and that immediately sort of communicates part of his motivation, that of overcoming his incompetence. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. I hadn't really thought of that. Um, but with with Norville and, and with Ramblers, it was uh, within the span of, of, or within the scope of the show, we needed to design the characters appropriately. So sure. it, I guess the, the sash was a really good way to, for us to show. Yeah. Um, every, like, just... At least as far as the hierarchy of of the scouts go, like where do these people stand? Yeah. And it, it brings up a good point. I was one of my first jobs was designing at this uh, a bigger studio in in Toronto called Nelvana, mm. and that was that was definitely like a factory grind of a of a studio. Sure. Great great work, but um, you you got a really quick sense, real fast, of like how things are set up for a big studio. And what I found is that they're very rigid. And I'll give you an example that has to do with character design. So I was on a show, and I was working on some designs. And in the script, the there was uh, this character that drove a garbage truck. So he was like a bad guy, and his you know his Batmobile was this garbage truck. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was something where I said, "Oh, you know what would be great is I'm going to design the garbage truck this way, and I'm going to design this guy that way. So what they should do is add a line where he says." Uh, you know, open it up or something like that. I don't know what it is. And uh, I was I was very quickly kind of slapped on the wrist and just said, you know, script script is locked. The script was locked six months ago. <laughs> and I'm like, but you can't go in and add a line. And they're like, no. So it it was very much set up in in the fact that like they did the script. The script got approved. Yeah, it had all its notes. And then it goes to storyboards. The storyboards does this. Da da da. That gets approved. On. Always moving forward. Yeah. Always moving forward. And there was no chance to, to influence the story yeah. through the designs in the same way maybe I did with Ramblers where I designed Norval to be incompetent and so he had no, no uh, patches on his sash. Sure. Um, and that was, that, was always, that was a little disheartening for a young, a young artist uh, yeah. to say like, oh, okay. Because I think that is the difference between shows that end up being really good and, and not so good. And Clone High is a great example because if you look at that show, just thinking about how the music incorporates it's like they had to think of so many things up front that that span all the way through there they definitely weren't working from the point of view of of just you know approved script and move forward and south park's probably the same way they redo everything until the last minute yeah they do yeah it's that yeah that that kind of horrific idea of getting a show done in six days but um but no sometimes yeah as we say you know that kind of deadline can make you creative for sure and it's um it's interesting in, in Canada we don't have a lot of board driven shows and I think I think it's because of, of what our uh, infrastructure has always been which is this all our script writers are also at a house for the yes. most part all our board artists are at a house so they they freelance they do a ton of stuff because if you're if you're getting paid by the board uh, typically you can make a lot more money working on five shows at yeah. once than working on, working in house on one show right. so it's just kind of always been set up that way and when we started our studio um, 
we aimed to to at least for that not or at least for us not do that um and we were partially successful mm. um I, I also learned, you know, later after starting my own shop that, you know, a, a script has its place early on. Right. And Super Science Friends is a great example because the first episode we tried to um, we tried to write it at the boards because we were like, yeah, it'll be like Adventure Time. This will be great. It makes for a better show. But the show is a sitcom. Like it's it's as, yeah. as much a sitcom as a live action sitcom is. So um, we just floundered because uh, because it should have had a script. Like that's where the funny comes is from the dialogue. It's like Family Guy. Right. You don't sit sit down and board Family Guy. I mean, maybe they do, but um, but it feels like a show that you, that you just write and yeah. then you go to boards. And so that's what we do with Super Science Friends now. Is but we still leave it open so that we have the opportunity in designs or in in boards to ref to um, reflect back on what ends up getting recorded. Yeah, it's not the norm for a, um, a, an animated series to be not board driven. Um, and yeah, even like pitching to, to studios, um, they want you to, to show some boards and beat boards. Um, yeah. So that, that's become the norm. But it's interesting that you guys have, have taken the script. And you say that's, that's, the, that's the norm in Canada. Is that what the Canadian industry is like? Then? Usually. There's a lot of people trying to change it because I think we look at shows abroad that um, are just better. So like okay. Adventure Time, like all those Cartoon Network shows are are. are better and just more fully fleshed out and the characters are more alive i think yeah. than a lot of the stuff that we do so it's i think you can't help but look at them and say like what are they doing different and the first thing out of the gate that they're doing different is that they it's it comes together in the board definitely yeah so brett tell me about this character you're you're designing have you given it a name yet uh i can i can give him a name i'm gonna <laughs> name him uh he's gonna be known as Who does he look like so far? He's half a head and part of a mustache so far. So, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna call him Mr. Pib. Mr. Pib, the the slightly better version of Dr. Pepper. Exactly. <laughs> and maybe maybe the backstory of that is that uh, when they were naming him, because this in in this shoddy uh, you know back alley surgery room, maybe there was a uh, pop machine there or a soda machine, I should say. And uh, maybe it was Mr. Pibb. So when they had to write something down on his birth certificate, they just said, yep, yeah, Mr. Pibb. So his first name is Mr., second name Pibb. Oh, that's, that's perfect and beautiful in its own little way. Okay, a little bit of drama now. Your young, apparently already mustachioed character is safely in his crash. In your design studio. Probably with lots of dangerous things around, but we're not going to question your parenting skills. Now... Regrettably, it's been invaded by a particular set of bandits. Four horsemen. Not of the apocalypse, just men who also happen to be horses. How are you personally going to defend him? Uh, I think, so it's four horsemen. Four horsemen. Not of, not of the not apocalypse. Not of the apocalypse, but they're just also horses. Just, just also horses. Uh, I think if I were to, des- if I were to uh, try and defend someone from horsemen... I mean, I, I'm assuming I don't have a spear handy. Um, yeah, do you have something but, you can fashion into a spear? Yeah, I guess I could take that. Uh, I guess I could take the scalpel that was probably used in his birthing, as, which is a memento, and I could fashion that on the end of some sort of yardstick. Okay. So yeah, I, I, see, I think the one thing I would do that they never show on TV is I would kill the horses. That's for, that's step number Excellent. one. Like we saw it in Braveheart, and we haven't seen it since. Where you've got to spear the horses. How do they always survive? Like you see the horses run through these like wall of spears, and just the people on top get killed. It's ridiculous. Brett, you are sick and wonderful. Yes, we will <laughs> spear the horsemen. But let's ask Suitcase first. Suitcase, if you wouldn't mind. Five. So you, you you've got two of the horsemen. I'm afraid to spear. Two of them are dead. You killed those two dead. They're not coming back. The other two, unfortunately, are going to kind of run rampant between you and Mister Pib. So I'm afraid you're going to have dis- to disable Mister Pib in some way. What kind of disability are you going to give him? Uh, he's already looking pretty disabled. <laughs> but let's um, let's give him legs. That are only as long as down to your knees. So a little <laughs> little homage to uh, King of the Hill with Cotton. Excellent. Where, he, where his his shins were shot off in Vietnam, and so they sewed his feet to his knees. Marvellous. We're going to do the civilized thing and take a tea break. 
Even though, shockingly, you only drink Earl Grey when it's Star Trek related. Let's pretend for now that I'm a competent human person who cares, and tell me, what's getting you excited at the moment? I'm excited to, well, if, if it's work-wise, then uh, we're working on our sixth episode, and it's 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 taking a long time, but it's going to be worth the wait, so I'm excited about that, because it's I do the compositing here as well, so oh, sure. um, whenever a shot gets finished or a background gets finished, I, I'm kind of the first one to see it, which is nice. Yeah. Um, so there's that. I'm excited about that. I'm... Um, I'm going to the Ottawa Animation Festival in, in a week or two, so I'm excited about that as well. I haven't been in a few years, and uh, are you taking it's, anything it's, with you? Or? No, I'm. I'm. Well, I guess I am. I, I'm mostly going there to meet with uh, some people that I met on a trip that I did earlier this year to South Africa. Cool. It was a it was a conference that they brought a lot of like industry people over there for. Yeah. So get to meet with those guys. Uh, I think I'm going to be on a panel, which is nice. Great. Um, hopefully I don't say anything out of line. <laughs> <laughs> I remember telling, I was on a panel a few years ago where I, like here in Toronto, we're at an animation festival, and we had some head, like a head of a big cartoon uh, sort of network here. Not Cartoon Network, but a cartoon network yeah. from Canada. They were, at the time, because this was enough years ago where we were talking about, like, what is the future of broadcasting? And they they were like, well, we're just gonna have to wait and see. We're gonna you know see what the, we see what people do. and I and I lost my shit and I was just like, no, we know what it is because Netflix was now a thing. And I said I said Netflix, YouTube. It's like it, that's it. It's I want to watch you know season two episode five of The Simpsons. I want to watch it on whatever thing I'm holding. Bloop 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 bloop. I'm watching it. That's the end game. There's that nothing is. beyond that. Yeah. Uh, and they were talking about like, well, you know, television might see a resurgence. Or cable. I'm like, you, you, you guys are are fooling yourself. <laughs> so, like, whereas I should have been very cordial and professional and, and just sat no, quietly and nodded. You should have I gone further because that's uh, insisting that television still has a future. It's like stuffing tacos into a corpse just to try and yes. keep it alive. <laughs> <laughs> so, what uh, what animations are you interested in at the moment? What what are you what are you watching? What am I watching? I just I actually speaking of Archer, I just started watching the latest season of Archer. I'm interested. Did you ever get Archer fatigue? I kind of got Archer fatigue after one and had to take a nice little rest. Yeah, they they just started. Well, I guess with last season was the first one where they started doing this thing where he's in a coma. Yeah, and so there it allows them to branch out and do crazy things. So this one is Danger Island. So right. it, and it's the one thing I will appreciate is it's based on this very obscure show called. Um, Something of the Golden Monkey. I can't remember what it was, but the the father from Seventh Heaven was played this Indiana Jones type character. It's from the eighties, and the fact that they would homage something so obscure just yeah. has a little like because we do that stuff as much as we can. Uh, we always say that we write episodes for that one guy, <laughs> and it's just that one guy who's going to go. Ah. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent um, obscure reference. Yeah, but what I am looking forward to, actually, what I'm very much looking forward to is. Um, when we finish our seventh episode of Super Science Friends, mm. I have promised myself that I'm going to take a week off work, which is unheard of, and what? watch all the cartoons that I have purposefully not watched because I didn't want them to influence me in the oh, show. Interesting. So shows I haven't watched are uh, season five and later of Adventure Time. Okay. I haven't watched any. No Steven Universe. Mm. No Gravity Falls. No Rick and Morty. Whoa. Uh, so I haven't seen any of that stuff. And and they're all shows that people go like, oh my god, you would love that show. And I'm like, I know I would love that show. And that's exactly why I'm not watching it. Because my show would quickly become like the Super Rick and Morty show. As I say, it takes a lot of discipline to avoid those shows. Yeah. I follow him on Instagram, but it's usually, it's just, it's random stuff where it's just like a picture and then some sort of caption that they put on it that has nothing to do with the, the show. Yeah. Yeah, that's got to be a weird one when you see the uh, an influx of Pickle Rick pictures when you have no idea what's going on. Exactly. I don't know what Pickle Rick is, but I've seen a lot of them. Sure. So uh, that's, uh, a, that's an interesting point, actually. Why do you feel that those particular shows would influence what you're doing? Because I'm, I'm easily influenced. Uh, <laughs> to the point where, where if I watch a movie yeah. that has a particular cadence of speech or accent, mm -hmm. I find it will... Well, my girlfriend finds that it will infiltrate my own... Mm -hmm speech nice and i'll suddenly be speaking with you know maybe an irish accent or something or sl or some I, I went on a whole like scottish thing where i watched like shetland and uh broad church and stuff like that so there's wow. just a whole lot of scottish and at, at once and so i ended up speaking with a bit of a scottish twang for a little <laughs> while 
much to her chagrin. Wow. So I'm I'm just easily influenced, and when some and I'm I'm been brought up in the industry to to know that if if you've got a good idea or if you see a good idea, it's like you better take it, mm-hmm. especially when you're in some sort of writer's room or there's really no room for ego there. So right. um, uh, like when we were on, I've worked on shows where the writers are so in love with their own writing that. You know, even if you cast a character with a funny voice that makes it legitimately funnier, they'll they'll insist that they recast with someone with a very bland voice, so that their written dialogue oh, is the center yeah. of attention. And I always was I was always just turned off by that. So, um, as a result, I ended up being very very easily influenced. And to to my earlier uh, statement of not having a, a design style of my own the way I was able to keep myself fed working as a character designer was being able to copy other people's styles. Right. So I'd get hired a lot to, because they couldn't get that guy. They couldn't get Sean Galloway. So sure. they said, Brett, can you just do this in Cheeks' style? And I'd be yeah. like, yeah, all right, I'll give it a shot. And it was all for development for mostly. So none of it actually made it on air, but uh, that was my thing was I could look at some stuff and I could be like, yeah, okay. I, I see what, I see the things they did. I see what round things they made square or vice versa. And, and I can copy that. Do you study there when you're trying to uh, not not copy, but sort of uh, suggest somebody else's style? I suppose is the polite way of putting it. Um, yeah. do, do you do you study what they do and and kind of point and see what they repeat, or, or what's the process? Yeah, I think so. Again, not as consciously as that, but yeah. uh, I don't sit down and make notes or anything like that. But it, it is I I just I think I, it's probably more trial and error. So I draw something and then I look between the two and I go like, oh no no, it's not there yet. What what's different? Um, which I appreciate. I, I the way I learned how to draw was as by copying comics. So I specifically Todd McFarlane comics. My yeah. brother's Todd McFarlane comics, which he was very upset oh. that I, I you know, increased the spine and stuff like that. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, that's just been the way. That's the way I would draw. Is is uh, is that? And after Spider Man, it was. Uh, Warcraft 2 was a game I was really into and I, I would just endlessly looked through the, the user manual because yeah. there was a guy named Samwise at Blizzard who drew a particular way which looking back is not a great style but it really it had an influence on me at the time so I would draw like him for a little while and it just kind of kept going like that until eventually I'd, I'd collected a hodgepodge of enough styles that I was able to work out some sort of you know style of my own I guess now, we've already established that people mostly know you for Super Science Friends, but what's something they'd have to dig around in the muck a little bit for? Uh, I, have, I have one shameful uh, chapter in my, in my <laughs> history, and, this is, and I'll tell you how I came to, to discover that it had made the light of day. So I was working on development at Nelvana, doing that thing where it's like, you know, copy the style kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I did... They wanted uh, this one show they had optioned called Fishtronaut, which, from the title, you can already tell is is uh, what obviously it is. Obviously genius. It's obviously genius. <laughs> and it's a fish that has come up from under the water wearing an astronaut outfit, and so now he can exist above ground. Uh, it's a reverse of, of whatever her name is from uh, SpongeBob, oh, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sandy Cheeks. Sandy Cheeks. And so... I did this Bible. I did all these designs. At the time, I was very obsessed with making characters look like me. So it was a lot of like little blonde boys with spiky hair. Yeah. And uh, there were these two brothers, and, and so that's what I did for them, and, and etc. And then I never heard anything from it. So I I just kind of went on my merry way. I got paid my you know two hundred bucks or whatever it was, and and off I go. Flash forward like four or five years and I'm working on another series and it's actually production. So I'm, I'm in the house working on, and they're excited because there's this festival called, or this conference called kid screen. And they're sending the show that we were working on, which was this Australian show called dirt girl world to kid screen. And they had bought an ad in the magazine, in the kid screen magazine. And so we get it delivered. We're so excited. And we tear it open and we, we look at it. And on the left, there's the ad for our show. And we're like, Oh yeah, it looks great. And on the right, is an ad for this Brazilian show called Fishtronaut, which is in its fourth season. What? It's got like a movie on Discovery Kids in Brazil. No. And it's my designs. They didn't change anything. They just, uh, I later looked into it. I called my producer from Nova and I said, what the hell? It's like, man, you don't want to give a guy a phone call and tell me yeah. his stuff has been on TV. And, uh, 
and she was like, oh, yeah, we, we packaged it. It didn't do well at, at the MIP or wherever they took it to sell it. And so they just packaged the whole thing up and they sold it to Discovery Kids in Latin America or in Brazil. Wow. Um, just oh, or, or I think it was to another distributor or something. Anyway, they, they were no longer involved with it. They sold the whole thing. And from that, it got resold and resold and eventually wound up in Brazil. And they eventually made a bunch of shows. And at the, at, for a brief time, it was like the number one kids show in Brazil. Wow. And uh, the designs are awful. Like looking back, they're just bad. And and actually, because the the local artists in Brazil had to fill in all the characters that I didn't do, okay. or all the characters that would have come up in random scripts, their designs don't match my style. But they're way better. So if they if they just taken the show and like redesigned it themselves, it would have been so much better, and it would have been so less like uh, gut wrenching for me to look at it and just oh, feel like oh no. god. Yeah, so it was that. That was my uh, that's my shady past when it comes to uh, character design. But now we're all going to go and look at it, so you know. It's... Yeah, you should you <laughs> should go look up Fisher Not. It's not even that bad. It's just kind of like blah. How, how deep have you gone into it? Have you watched all four seasons and? The... <laughs> <laughs> no, I've I've watched a single episode. What I loved is that they they did make one addition to it, which was the addition of this magic beach ball that. Mm that flies around with these very kind of obviously like after effects particle effects going on behind it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that is what gives them, I guess they also changed Frisch or not into being some sort of private detective. So they, uh, so that's, that's the Charlie of, of the, the show is like, he gives them the cases and then they go and they solve the cases. Oh, nice. So that was my favorite part was seeing the magic beach ball. It's like, oh, okay. Okay. Back to the task at hand. Now, I know when designing characters, one of the areas I find myself a little bit lazy in is fashion. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty lazy when it comes to fashion, too. Like, I, I, at one point in my life, I went and I bought, I was inspired, and I was like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this seriously. And I went and I bought a bunch of fashion books and, like, how to draw costumes and costuming. Oh, yeah. And I never crack the spine. They just sit on my shelf. And so Super Science Runs makes it easy because... Typically, there's a photo of yeah. one of these guys, and usually I'm just like, okay, that's the main photo. That's what we're drawing him in. Because uh, I, I like to design for that show based on what the what people are going to be familiar with. So yeah. if, if you're used to seeing Tesla in, in that little, you know, not quite a collar collared shirt, um, then that's what we'll do. But for other stuff, I'm, I'm pretty lazy. Although I, I did work on a show at, at, again in Alabama called The Future is Wild where it was a CG show mm-hmm. and I was designing this character and I'd, I was going through a part where I was being asked to draw a lot of um, a lot of groups of friends. So it'd be like four friends, they'd be like two girls, two guys uh, they'd always have to be varying like racial identities and, and stuff like that just to keep it diverse and I always tried to put in one character that was overweight because I thought oh. that that was I had seen Recess, like Disney's Recess, yeah, and I really yeah. like the character there. That's overweight, and I said, "That's nice." It's you know, a lot of this is going to go to the states. Like fucking two thirds of the states is overweight. Hey, apparently, it's going to be someone that's great for that. Yeah, yeah. we got to we got to represent. So I drew this one kid who was was overweight. Ethan was the character's name. Sure. And uh, and they and they they passed it. They said, "Yeah, that's good." So they approved it. But I also was a Kevin Smith fan who's an overweight dude. And I put, so I put him in these like Kevin Smith shorts, these like kind of <laughs> long shorts. Yeah. And my director said I couldn't put him in shorts. And uh, I was like, why? But he looks so good in these shorts with his little legs and the shorts. It's, it's such a great design. Yeah. And he just said, we don't know what script 19 is going to be. He's like, does script 19 have these characters going up a long ladder and the camera's going to be low? And we're like, what do we see there? That sort of thing. He's like, so you got to put them in pants because pants are all season. It's like you can you can show them in the summer. You can show them in the winter with these pants. Uh, you can show them in a variety of situations where if you put them in shorts, it's suddenly we need costume changes. We need all these things. And, and like it's added expense, uh, which I later would come to appreciate. Yeah. Uh, with how difficult costume changes can be on a show. Uh, but at the time I was pretty bummed because I was, I just was, I really preferred the drawing of him in the, uh, in the shorts, but it also was a good opportunity to kind of separate the art from myself yeah. uh, and become, become less of an artist, quote unquote, and more of like a, an artisan or a technician, sure. someone who's, who's hired to do a job. And so your guts don't get ripped out every time someone gives you a note on a character and says like, can we make the eyes a little bigger? Or something Absolutely. Like that. 
That's a good point to make. So what are the kinds of things that you find yourself getting precious about that you sort of cling to? Um, depends on the show. On, on Super Science Friends, it's, it's really the reason I keep going back to that one, even though I do a bunch of stuff, is yeah. that's the last show that I actually designed, right. uh, aside from Ramblers and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but it's I, I get particularly precious on that show with things like line weight. Like if the line yeah. is too thick and too thin in places, it's, it's it bugs me a lot. Um, there are certain things that we do and that we don't do on that show that are that I don't know until I see it. Yeah. So, um, for example, the little like dits, uh, which is what I call the little marks that are on people's coats and things like that, or in someone's beard, just those little detail lines, yeah. called them dits. And uh, they are done in a very particular way, depending on. Um, how big the character is in relation to the scene and also in relation to uh, what the material is. So dits on glass are done and are done diagonally and they're done a little bit longer Mm -hmm. and dits on concrete are done horizontally and they're done very short to look like pits, like pits in the concrete. And then on character stuff, it's usually up and down, but you have to flick your, your hand. So you want it to be thick at the bottom and thin at the top. So you kind of press and flick. And it's it's such a fucking sorry if I'm I have a muscle no, to swear. You, you swear away. It's such a fucking um, ridiculous skill to have, but no one can like very few people know how to do it properly. Yeah. Uh, so and we we use them on Ugly Americans, and we would have meeting after meeting after meeting about <laughs> dits, and we eventually like I think we assigned someone to just do all the dits, and that was their job, which was like a total shit job. Um, wow, that's cruel. You put someone on dit duty. That's uh... dit duty. And it was because we had no alternative. And it's it's one of those things where when you see it, when there's a variance from shot to shot, it's really obvious, or at least it was to us. Mm-hmm. So there are those things where I, maybe it's something no one else notices, but it's something that I notice. And I'm just like, but, I'm picking. people will notice when they when they're used to seeing things a certain way. When there's something just even slightly off kilter, like someone else has done this and they're not following the rules. I think so. Yeah. I, I'd like to think so anyway. Yeah. Choosing how you pose a character is another great way of communicating a lot about the character really swiftly. Do you find yourself putting a great deal of thought into posing characters in the design process? Yeah, it's um, it's it's to my great shame I've stopped posing characters. Um, uh, and I don't know when that happened. It was something like I look at my sketchbooks from high school and there would be all these what I would consider like very daring poses of oh, like, yeah. you know, perspective and, and things like that and at some point probably when i started becoming a professional character designer um it all went to standing straight three quarter maybe yeah. one arm in the air and that was just because that was the best way to show the character sure. for the for to the client and and you don't know it at the time but you lose the you lose the um the courage I guess, right. to, to try and pose the character. Like, you become very fearful of messing up. Definitely. Um, and I guess it's it's the equivalent to writer's block. Like, you, you're fearful to try something new or, or whatever. You just can't get past it. So it takes a long time of me not being at work uh, to get out of that. And I've, I think, like, my last real vacation was, um, like, you know, where I went and sat on a beach for a while, was, I think either just after or just before we started the studio, so like 2012, 2011. And I remember at the very last day of that week-long vacation, something switched in my head, and I was able to kind of just sit and draw, like like stream of consciousness draw, and I drew these super forced perspective drawings. Yeah. Which I was, I'm was i still really proud of, and I really like them. They're probably the best thing I've ever done. Um, and... But it, it takes me kind of zoning out in a big way to, to get there. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's a cop-out. Maybe I could, if I just sat down this afternoon, I could try it until I got it. But uh, it flowed so naturally out of me at that point that right. that it feels like it's something more than just effort that's involved. Do you feel that, that the reason for that is um, perhaps the utility of what you're using the character for on one hand and then the freedom of being in, in that kind of atmosphere on the other? Yeah, yeah, I don't like to waste a lot of time, so it's yeah. if I draw something, I like to draw it in a way where it's not a far leap to the next step. Right. But it is. it does make, you know, as I mentioned, it makes my sketchbook a little bit boring. Do your sketchbooks have a lot of unused characters that you can kind of take bits and pieces from and kind of Frankenstein them together to use in projects? 
Oh, yeah. If it's the same show, if I'm designing a character for the same show, very rarely will I just start from scratch. Um, I'm usually saying, like, okay, how tall is he? What's he wearing? Because for, for Super Science Friends, they're, they all wear brown suits. So yeah. uh, I just grab whoever's the closest, and then I start erasing from there, and I just rejig. And, it, again, it's usually it's very utilitarian because it's I'll have, uh, you know, 100 things to do that day, and designing this character isn't one of them usually. So sure. it's, I have to get it done quickly, and I have to hand it off to somebody else. Um so yeah, it, it's it's very much work, and and I I um, there's a guy there's a, a guy I think he's a director now named Eric Robles. I think he created a show called Fanboy and Chum Chum. From oh yeah, Nickelodeon. Yeah. So he was working as a character designer on the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Yeah. When I met him, and he was just rolling off of that to go work on a show called The X's for Nickelodeon, and I was out in Los Angeles, and I got a tour of Nickelodeon. And he said that they were looking for a new designer on the X's, and I should apply. So I did the test and, and stuff like that. And so in the process of me like doing the test like five times trying to get this job, which I never ended up getting, um, he uh, we we talked a lot about it. And he he mentioned like basically being in the zone when it yeah. comes to character design. And so when he got the show the X's for himself, he was already working through a bunch of Billy and Mandy designs, and then someone said, hey, you should try it for the show. Mm-hmm. So he just, like, at the end of his day, he slid the Billy and Mandy stuff off, he slid the test on, he banged it out, because he was just, like, so warmed up, and he had been drawing all day, and he was just in the zone, and right. boom, done. And uh, it's true. Like, like at the time, I thought, like, oh, that's kind of bullshit. But um, now, having done his job later in life, it's 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 not bullshit at all. It's definitely true. It's like you get into these modes. Right. Where, uh, and it, it goes for anything. Like yesterday, I happened to um, had to approve scripts, so I read through like four or five scripts, and I changed what I needed to change, and I got them approved and out the door. But script reading is a real like that's a thing that I really don't like to do a whole lot. Um, right. But for some reason, yesterday I was just in the zone for script writing, and so I was able to crank through a bunch of them. Now, you started Tin Man Creative, which is a, a really good way of making sure that you only work on projects that you're interested in. But what methods and processes have you been able to apply to your own business that maybe weren't present on other productions you worked on? Um, the reason we started Tin Man was my partner Morgan and I worked together on a couple of shows. We worked together on Dirt Girl World and Ugly Americans. She was my producer on both. Yeah. And after that, both were kind of troubled projects. So we came in at a certain point where it was all kind of falling apart mm. and the budget was blown and there weren't enough people and whatever. And so we came in and we rearranged the crew in such a way where we were able to streamline it and get it back on track. Yeah. And, uh, and then we did it again for ugly Americans to a lesser extent. It was more of like with 2d animation. Um, it's very math, like you very predictable mathematically. Sure. So, uh, that one there was a little less wiggle room, but we were still able to kind of get the get the season done and get it off to the to the uh, Comedy Central or uh, yeah Comedy Central, and um, and then we just started getting hiring to do the same thing after that. So we'd get hired to bring on to a commercial that had kind of gone awry or another show that had you know gone awry and, and just fix it. Yeah. And so our main our main reason for starting the studio was to hopefully start doing projects ourselves and hopefully set them up properly from the start so that we didn't have to fix it. And if we did have to fix it and have to stay there all night and, you know, for weeks on end, at least it was our own thing. Um, and there was a certain kind of solace in that, that you could let it power through at three in the morning. Um, but that was probably the main thing was just like keeping things very simple, but very organized. So I'm a real big stickler on naming conventions of files, as an example. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and any of my crew who have to deal with that stuff, they know how pissed I get when somebody names uh, something. Uh, like my big thing is name the file in the way that the computer will sort it properly. Right. So with dates, for example. And yeah. you don't, I don't need to tell you this because you're from the UK. You guys name shit properly. Exactly. But in the, in the US, as an example, whenever I get a file from somebody in the US, it's named like design to May 3rd, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not going to, it's going to sort it alphabetically. You don't yeah. want to do that. Yes. The library has to look a specific way. Exactly. And uh, so if somebody messes with that, I just lose my mind because I'm just, it's such, it's such, it's like my, I don't know, computer logic brain or something like that <laughs> that just freaks out. Um, 
And that's something that it, it's tricky. Like we have a crew now of, of um, not just on Tin Man, but we, our, our kids' side of things is in a company called Skyship. Okay. And there's, you know, 40 or so people that are working in various capacities with us. And so everyone has to be taught the hard lesson oh. when they come in of like, this is how you name a date. And every once in a while, some poor soul uh, forgets, and then I and it ends up getting through the layers to me, and I just like lose my shit. <laughs> you have to. That that keeps me from like having to drown kittens at the end of the day. So I'm like, as long as things are named properly, everything is right with the world. Yes, as fun as drowning kittens can be, they do tend to fight back. <laughs> Personally, I find my best character designs are the product of a lot of reworking in certain areas. Where do you find yourself mostly reworking your characters? Um, very rarely. Um, I, mostly because like a lot of the artists that work at the studio now are better designers than I am. Right. So it's it, it would be very it'd be a lot of hubris for me to um, say, no, 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 I got this one, and then work through a design and rework it and rework it and yeah. rework it. Um, so thankfully, I don't have to do that. But on the but I do give notes, so oh, okay. um, I do make them rework stuff. Uh, <laughs> and and in some cases, it's it's fun to like look back. We we in every project we keep a folder just called Dev, and that's the one folder where they're allowed to be messy with their sure. files because it's just like it's early development stuff and it's just getting thrown in there. And uh, every once in a while, I'll have cause to go back into one of those folders looking for something, and I'll just see the the transformation that a group of characters will make right over the over the course of the the uh, whatever six months or something that we're developing a show and it's great it's it's you just realize like how far you've come uh and how how that early one that you thought like yeah this is the one and then you rethought it after and rethought it after like sure. in a lot of cases you're right like you're right to rework it I think it can it can reach a limit like if you if you what I call George Lucasing it where you know a year later like right now I'm going through a thing where I'm I'm looking at Super Science Friends and I'm looking at early episodes that we did a few years ago yeah and I think like oh man if I could get back in there and just change a few things um, I, I would That's I would make this make more things. sense That's exactly <laughs> how you kill things so it's it's um, I have to be careful of that but it's uh, yeah so I, I I I don't rework much of my own stuff these days but I used to do a thing where Every year I would draw the same theme. Mm -hmm. So I would draw a red samurai with a flaming sword, the okay. flaming katana. And that was kind of my benchmark for how much I had progressed that year and uh, or what style I happened to be working in at the time. So right. for a number of years, probably like seven or eight years in a row, I did the same illustration. And I eventually got out of the habit of it, sadly. So I would have loved to have kept that going. But that was my rework thing, uh, was, was reworking that character over and over again. Well, it's that time. Mr. Pibb is going to meet his untimely demise. I mean, you've already decided he's not going to have a very nice life anyway, so why should he have a particularly nice death? But that's entirely up to you. How's it all going to end? Well, I... I... And I Mr. Pibb can't be killed by Dr. Pepper. That's not going to work. <laughs> Dr. Pepper was the one that birthed him. Oh, it was course. an odd twist of fate. Was that was the doctor who was in the birthing room? <laughs> um, all right, let me look at this guy and think. Like, what <laughs> is going to befall him? I feel like he can't run very fast because of the horses mangling his legs yeah. and leaving him with shinless legs. So it's going to have to be something catching up with him, or maybe some sort of falling down the stairs because he can't quite make it up over oh, that last. No. He's got no bend <laughs> in his legs. Um, drowning seems likely, but... <laughs> in the shallow end of the pool. <laughs> unfair. Yeah, I could see him drowning in the shallow end. Um, so it's a, I think it's a toss-up between being trampled. Maybe the horse comes back. Those, oh, those last two horses were never man. there. Oh. So, so there's unfinished business between him and these horses. So I think... I see him being, you know, eight years old or so, and they finally come back, and they want vengeance for the fact that they that he that I, I guess, uh, in his name, killed those other two horses. Ah. And so I'm picturing a scene kind of like the plane coming down. I can't remember the movie. Uh, it's it's like that old movie where they see the plane there in the cornfield and they run for North it. it might by be Northwest. Hitch is that a Hitchcock movie? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, North by Northwest. So that, except with horses, which would be a similar perspective <laughs> for him because he's way down there. Yeah. So you just see these horses coming in to get him. 
as he runs, uh, you know, in in vain because he's obviously just gonna like try and make his way. So he he gets a they're they're fifty feet away, and he probably makes it about eight feet before they're on top of him. <laughs> well, that sounds like a quick and kind death. Let's see if suitcase agrees. Suitcase. <laughs> It's a nine. So, in a cornfield at a bearing somewhere north by northwest, the two remaining horsemen chase down poor Mr. Pip. They, of course, run him over, but he doesn't quite kick the bucket straight away, no. He's still breathing a little. So the horsemen have to back up over him, making those beeping sounds that large vehicles make as they reverse. Then they trample him forwards again. And reverse over him again. And then do a little jig over him once more in the Ford's direction until, with a little sputter and a twitch of his little shin legs, Mr. Pib is no more. Wasn't that lovely? Brett Jubinville, congratulations. You are now an official blackguard in the Society for Ungentlemanly Conduct. Your reward for murder, and there, there has to be a reward, otherwise it's just an ugly business, is you get to tell us about what ungodly nonsense you're getting up to next. Yeah, I guess, I mean, we're, uh, I would just like to say that if you, uh, if, if you like hearing me ramble, you can, you can tune in. We do a live, live stream on the Super Science Friends YouTube page every Friday. Yeah, I usually shoot my mouth, up, mouth off a little more than I should there <laughs> as well. Uh, otherwise, just if, if you happen to like the show, um, you can hit that subscribe button. Thank you for joining us, Brett. But now's the time for you to leave. However, it appears the fish have stolen your own vessel, so you're going to have to take a deep breath and swim for the surface. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun to kill this poor bastard. Good luck. Assuming Brett survives his break for the surface, and the subsequent bends, you should go and check out episodes of Super Science Friends on YouTube, and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Character Assassination, produced by me, Nerius, and brought to you by Studio Squid Inc. You can find us on Instagram at Studio Squid Inc, and on our YouTube channel, Studio Squid Inc Animation. Join us again for more art, tea and murder most foul on another barely competent episode of character assassination.